you know that whatever you may have gone through this week, hope is on your side. And you know, the good news about hope being on your side is faith is always on your side and once hope is on your side. The good thing about having faith and hope on your side is that when faith and hope in a, is on your side, then joy. There ought to be a joy. There ought to be a joy on your side. It's too much for me. Um, but um, just welcome the whole side. You know, I don't know what you may have gone through during the week, but we're, we're grateful to have you here. Um, it means a, I, I almost said an H-E-L-L of a lot, but it means a heaven of a lot. That every time I walk through these doors and I see your face, so I look forward to seeing you. You know, I'll be very honest with you. I love you very much. And I can also say that for the founder of this church, um, Brother Andy Chavacula, he loves you. He wouldn't have done this. He, this. This program is not a show. This is not for your entertainment. This is not for YouTube. This is for the spirit of God. Amen. 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 We are standing, and as that song stated, on holy ground, it just happens that once we're in the presence of faith, once we're in the presence of hope, once we're in the presence of joy, once we're on the presence, once we're in the presence of love, we're also in the presence of God. You didn't come here by yourself this morning. God's with you. We're in the presence of God. We are standing on holy ground. Um, I was just wondering, we want to, at this particular point in time, you know, this is the reason why we're here, along with the Spirit of God, we want to welcome our visitors. Do we have any visitors here? Do we have any uh, members of I I thought it was a Freudian slip because, um, you know, once you're here, we can sit into a member, you're a brother, and it says, you're a comrade, you're, you're a member of our family. We, we may have never seen you in our lives, but once you walk through those two doors back there, you're, you're a long lost brother, you're a long lost sister. Uh, you're a long, we're happy to see you. Aren't there any first time visitors here at Hopeside this morning? Oh, would you please stand? Oh, hey. Yeah. Yeah. Gentlemen and gentlemen, and this gentleman out uh, back here, just to give him the hand over one hand. And if you would be so kind, would you please tell us your name and just tell us a little bit about yourself, maybe in a couple sentences. We'll start with this gentleman in the back. His name is Glenn. Um, I'm a Christian. Jesus Christ is my Savior. Amen. Amen. I pray that everybody in here, Jesus Christ is your Savior too. Amen. Amen, Amen. Yes. If you haven't Amen. met Jesus Christ, I'm sure somebody here will tell you about him today. Um, and why that's important is on Good Friday, I found out my dad died. On Good Friday, the Lord told me my dad's dying through my sister in law. And why it's important to know the Lord is because someday each one of us will here will die. And there is an afterlife. It's heaven or hell. Amen. And your friends out there are dying. And I got friends out there dying. And I had friends dying this past few months. It's up to us to tell them about Jesus Christ. Nobody else. God didn't send his armies down here of angels. And there's a song Chris Taunton was saying about armies of angels. If you haven't heard it, it's a beautiful song. But God didn't send his angels out down here to tell people about Christ. God put us on this earth, his children, to tell people about Christ. And that's our major purpose here. We want to make it other things, and I have too. But it's not. Our major purpose here is to tell people about Christ at work, at home, and our neighbors, anywhere you're at. So God's impressed on my heart when my father's dying. You know, he's got about nine, six, nine months to live. But and I will see him, see him in heaven. Amen to that. Amen. Maybe, Amen. maybe 20, 30, 40 years, but I'll see him in heaven. I'll see him again. I have that promise. I have that hope. That you talked about. So that, that's, that's what God's been 
impressed it on my heart lately. Uh, you know your name again, sir? Uh, Glenn. Glenn? Yep. Oh, God bless you, Glenn. Thank so, you so much. So I'm, I'm happy to be here today. Thank you so much. God bless your heart. God bless you. This gentleman, would you please hold me? Be so kind. Tell us your name. Tell us a little bit about yourself. You have plenty of time. In order. Um, my name is Natalie. I'm from
when, you, when you're with other Christians, it's, it's like you're automatically with friends. Uh, there's something there that comes not from us, but it comes from Him. And it's, it's transmitted through us, and I can feel it. And we all feel it. And um, that, that's what's real. There's faith, hope, and love, and it's all real. And it, 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 it comes from God. And you want to be on that side. You want to be on the side of faith, hope, and love to experience the joy. And um, so, we, so God is real. He's, he's in our lives. He's a great physician. He's in the business of performing miracles. And there are times when we need a miracle. Yes. We, we have a friend who's dying, uh, Glenn's father. Uh, Glenn just heard that, that news about him. And it, it's, you know, I can't even say it. it I, I, if I found out something like that about my father, I, I, did, I don't know, you know, what I would do. It's, it's just, it's, where can you go? You can't rely on yourself for something like that. Only God can fix that. And he has. Glenn, Glenn will see his father again. You see him now, he'll see him in the future. And he knows that. You know God. And um, he's real. Um, there, are, there are prayer concerns, you know, amongst all of us. I have them too. I would just, just raise your hand and, and uh, um, let, let, bring those to the Lord. Look for the Lord because only he can, he can solve some of these problems. And they, they're out there. We, we all have them. Um, so I, I'd just like to, to uh, thank God for this time, to thank God for the wonderful things He has done in my life, and for the hope that He's given all of us, the gift of His Son, Jesus Christ, uh, for us to accept. And um, it, is, it is done. He did it. And um, he, the, that's the... the uh, the salvation, the eternal hope that we have. O oh Lord, um, creator of the universe, I, I just thank you for who you are and for your son, Jesus. In Jesus' holy name, I pray. Thank you. Amen. 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 Thank you. speaker this, uh, this morning is uh, no stranger to the pulpit. He is no stranger to preaching and he is no stranger to ministry nor he is a stranger to Hope Sign. Um, he's a good friend of mine. Um, I've known Corey for about two years now, Pastor Corey, and I have to say this is, um, I'm just going to give you a, a heart um, felt introduction meaning I'm just going to tell you about my interaction with Corey because everyone who knows Corey um, we have um, some gentlemen and gentlewomen here from WAU can state that Corey is a very kind thoughtful and warm individual um, I'm always taken back by that because every time I meet Corey every time I see Corey Corey gives you a handshake and he gives you a hug means a hell of a lot to me means a hell of a lot to me means a heaven of a lot to me. <laughs> but no, I, I just, I'm just taken back because I'm not, see, I know where that comes from. You see, that comes from a relationship with the Lord. <laughs> when you have a relationship with the Lord, you're gonna, you're gonna, they, people will know it. You know, you're going to get that handshake, you're going to get that hug, you're going to get that affirmation, you're going to get that love. And with the speaker this morning, we have that. Amen. 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 After the special music, the next voice you're going to hear from the throne of God, speaking through his man servant, Corey Marshall. Um, after, after the special music, the next voice you're going to hear is Corey Marshall. Amen? Amen. Heaven of a lot. <laughs>
heart. So I look to heaven and ask that you be with me now. Bless your people. May their hearts be open to receive your word. We've been here before, God, and we have never left nor forsaken. So speak through me in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Good morning, Hopeside. Good morning. I'd like to thank you all for the invitation to speak God's word before his people. It is a privilege and it is a joy divine to lean on the everlasting arm of God. Amen. And when one is called to, to speak on behalf of our Savior, it is one that requires, it is a task that requires that we hold on to the steadfast hand of God that will not fail us. Today is a particularly special day for me because um, like Brother Glenn, my father passed away and today is his birthday, he would have been 56 years old, but I too, like Brother Glenn, have that hope that when Jesus Christ returns, we will all be caught up in the air to meet him. Amen. I'd like to thank my family for coming here with me. Thank them for their support. And I just want to share what God has said with me to you today with the hope that when we leave here, we will leave here transformed Amen. and not the same as when we came in. Amen. One of the things that um, I have come to realize in my Christian experience is when we approach God's word, we fail to ask ourselves two questions. Now the first question is, what is the will of God for my life in approaching this text? What is the will of God for my life when I approach this text? And the second question is, where is the righteousness of Christ in this text that will cause me or empower me to do the will of God for my life? The first question is more theoretical in nature, while the second demands a practical application of people. So today, in our exploration of Matthew, the 19th chapter, these are the two questions that we will attempt to answer in pursuit of understanding how we are to inherit eternal life. Turn with me, if you will, in your Bibles to Matthew, the 19th chapter, and we'll be reading from verses 16 to 22. Matthew, the 19th chapter, verses 16 to 22. And Brother Andy, the word of God reads, And behold, one came and said unto him, Good master, what good thing shall I do that I may have eternal life? I'll read the first verse again. Stay with me. And behold, one came and said unto him, Good master, what good thing shall I do that I may have eternal life? And he said unto him, Why callest thou me good? There is none good but one, that is God. But if thou wilt enter into life, keep the commandments. He saith unto him, Which? Jesus said, Thou shalt do no murder. Thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness. Honor thy father and thy mother, and thou sh shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. The young man saith unto him, All these things have I kept from my youth up, what lack I yet? Jesus said unto him, If thou wilt be perfect, go, and sell that thou hast, and give to the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven. And come and follow me. But when the young man heard that singing, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. I know it says in the bulletin that the sermon is entitled Take the Journey. But the purpose of taking the journey is to know the only true God, as we read in our scripture reading from John 17, chapter 3 and Jesus Christ, who he has sent. So today, instead of the title, Take the Journey, I prefer to call it, To Know Them. 
to know them. Here, in the book of Matthew, chapter 19, first and foremost, we are familiar with the, the, we are familiar with the author of the text. His name is Matthew. He was once a publican, and Jesus saw him sitting at the receipt of customs, and he was called. Now, he writes this book with the purpose of pursuing the Jews that Jesus, the son of David, is indeed the Messiah. Matthew writes this book with the purpose of educating his audience, of informing his audience that Jesus is, in, is indeed the Messiah. And in the 19th chapter, I'm pretty sure that most of us, if not all of us, are familiar with this story of the rich young ruler. But I dare to take you one step further and express to you that there are three different stories within this passage that contain the same train of thought from a different perspective. The first story we read from Matthew chapter 19 verses 1 to 12. And it addresses a situation that occurs between Jesus and the Pharisees. The second story is between Jesus and the children who come to be blessed in verses 13 to 15. And finally, the verses that we just read to culminate what is being expressed in inheriting eternal life. All three of these points point us to forsake ourselves for the sake of inheriting eternal life. In the first account, Jesus has left Galilee and he has entered Judea. He is followed by a great multitude and heals the sick among them. He is then approached by the Pharisees who raise the issue of divorce with the intent of testing him. They come to him in verse 3 and they ask him the question, is it lawful for a man to put away his wife for every cause? But before we can understand why they are testing him, we have to know who the Pharisees are and what they believe in. Now the Pharisees are a group of teachers who strictly observe the religious ceremonies and customs of their day. Of their day. They adhered to the oral laws and traditions, and what they believed in was the coming of a Messiah and in the afterlife. I'll say that one more time. The Pharisees believed in the coming of a Messiah, and they believed in the afterlife. One more time. The Pharisees believed in the coming of a Messiah and in the afterlife, Elvis. So listen to this now. So when the Pharisees come to test Jesus, they're not coming to test Jesus, they're coming to test his calling because remember, Matthew writes to prove to his audience that Jesus is indeed the Messiah. So now, hear this. If Jesus is surely the Messiah, he is one that must know the law and must keep it. Based on this chapter, we see we see now that Jesus, in his response to them, does not please them when he says that when God made man and woman, the two individuals come together to make one flesh. Then the Pharisees say, well, how come Moses said that you can issue a bill of divorce to the woman that you are married to and you are no longer pleased with. Jesus says to them, Moses, out of the hardness of your heart, has caused you to put away your wives. But there is one thing that the Pharisees don't understand. What the Pharisees don't understand is when Jesus answers their question, what he attempts to do is to save their souls for the sake of salvation while they are trying to satisfy themselves and preserve their souls unto condemnation. You see, Jesus' answer is an attempt not only to save the Pharisees, but four individuals at the same time. Look at Jesus' answer in, 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 in verses 8. We'll start there. He said unto them, Moses, because of the hardness of your heart, suffered you to put away your wives. But from the beginning, it was not so. And I say unto you, whosoever shall put away his wife, except it be for fornication and shall marry another, committeth adultery, and whoso marrieth her, which is put away, doth commit adultery. Now hold on. Look at what's happening here. 
Jesus is trying to say the man who puts away the woman outside of the cause of fornication. Jesus is trying to save the other woman that the man who puts away his wife for from adultery. Jesus is trying to save the other person that will pick up the woman that was divorced. Three people. And finally, Jesus is trying to save that man that will marry that woman that was put away. So the disciples, so, so Jesus, in a single move, attempts to save four people with one blow. Amen. Awesome. Based on what is being said here, we can see that Jesus is indeed the Messiah because at the end of the day, what the, the Messiah sets out to do is to first defend the integrity of God's law and protect his people in the process. I'll say that one more time, you didn't get it. The Messiah attempts to defend the integrity of God's law and save his people, protect his people in the process. In, in the process. Right, Alice? Awesome. <laughs> you see, what we have to realize is this. These Pharisees, they were teachers of the law. And at the end of the day, when the disciples hear what Jesus' response to them is, they ask this question. If the case of a man be so with his wife, is it not good to marry? We have to realize that the Pharisees were teachers of the law, and their example left a deep impression on the minds of those who observed them. And that is what happens when one attempts to wholeheartedly follow someone that they believe is a bearer of the truth and find out in all reality that they're not. But this is the mindset that Jesus came to correct. You see, Jesus, when standing before Pilate, he said that, I came to bear witness of the truth. I came to bear witness of the truth. The truth is what sets us free. And what the Pharisees were, were, were teaching the people were not the truth. You see, they were manipulators of the law. So at the end of the day, when they put away their wives, what they would do is look for a cause inside of the law to help justify the reason as to why it's okay for me to put away my wife. And sometimes when we approach certain situations in God's law, we justify it. But you know, it's just a piece of cake. You know, at the end of the day, Jesus doesn't want me to starve. So I'm going to go purchase some food on the Sabbath. At the end of the day, you know, I need a new pair of jeans, but I have 17 pair of other jeans in my, in, in my closet. <coughs> Realizing that I can only wear one at a time. We have to stop being gluttons for what we desire so that the will of God can be done inside of us. Amen. 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 There is nothing that is going to hurt us more than finding one little bit of justification when Christ comes. It's the little things that will keep us out of heaven. So when Jesus makes this statement, to his, when, when his disciples ask this question and he makes this statement, you see at the end of the day, what he wants to do is preserve their souls so that when he comes, they can inherit the kingdom that his father had prepared for them. Mm -hmm. We have to realize that Jesus is not teaching them a concept that is foreign to them. You see, Jesus says that not everybody can receive the same. In verse 12, he says, there are some who are born eunuchs. There are some who are made eunuchs, and there are some who were made, some who made themselves eunuchs for the sake of the kingdom of heaven. Now, in the context of this verse, of this chapter, the kingdom of heaven is synonymous with eternal life. It means, it means the same thing as eternal life. So what Jesus is saying, he's reiterating a point that he made in Matthew chapter 5, verses 27 to 32. Which says that, I don't hear your Bibles rustling. When I say something, I want you to go back and look to make sure that I'm right. Because at the end of the day, I can stand up here and say anything to you. That's the problem with our church. That's the problem with our people. We are not studying for ourselves. Follow me as I talk to you so that you can proof text what I'm saying to you so you know I'm not speaking out of my behind. He's reiterating a point that he makes in Matthew chapter 5, verses 27 to 32. Jesus said, if your right hand offend thee, cut it off. If your right eye offend thee, pluck it out. It is better to enter the kingdom of heaven maimed 
Did I say to you the kingdom of heaven is synonymous with the concept of eternal life? It is better to enter the kingdom of heaven main than have your whole body cast into hell. So the whole thing is about being preserved unto salvation. So when Jesus makes this point, what he's trying to do is tell you that in order to inherit eternal life, which is abiding in the presence of the Father for eternity, physically, but the first thing you have to do, the first thing you have to do is to deny your body and the desires thereof. Amen. 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 Solomon, excuse me, before I get to Solomon, Paul says it in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. He says, when we fornicate, he says we sin against the body. He says the only sin that we commit against the body. But, but, but Solomon, in Proverbs chapter 6 and verse 32, he goes one step further. He says, he who commits adultery lacks understanding. He who commits adultery lacks understanding and brings upon his soul damnation, destruction. Excuse me. He brings upon his soul destruction. And that's what Jesus is trying to save these people from. That's what Jesus is trying to save us from. At the end of the day, we are committing spiritual adultery. But God wants to win us back into his kingdom so that we can abide in the presence of God for eternity. Amen. 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 The second point is denial of status for the sake of eternal life. When you read Matthew chapter 19, verses 13, and four, 13 to 15, it says that then were there brought unto him little children, that he should put hands on them and pray. Amen. And the disciples, Elvis, rebuked them. But Jesus said, suffer little children, allow the little children. And forbid them not to come unto me, for such is the kingdom of heaven. And he said, and, and he laid his hands on them. Jesus laid his hands on them and departed thence. Now hold on, Brother Corey. You just said that this verse addresses the denial of status for the sake of the kingdom of heaven. But what Jesus here is teaching, or what Jesus is reiterating, is a concept that he speaks to his disciples in Matthew chapter 18, verses 1 to 6. You see, at the end of the day, the disciples, they come to Jesus, and they bring this question to him. They postulate this question, and they ask him, who shall be the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? The kingdom of heaven, eternal life. Jesus says to them, he calls a little child, and he sent him in the midst. But now pay attention. Jesus says, why are you focusing on greatness? Before you focus on greatness, you need to worry about getting there. And he says, except you be like, except you be converted and you become as this little child, you cannot begin to think that you will get in the kingdom of heaven. At the end of the day, children, children, they were low status dependents in the sight of their society. Which means that they don't have a voice, their opinion didn't count, and what I can't begin to understand is, how can someone give birth to another person and their existence means nothing to them? So when Jesus calls this little child in the midst, what he's saying is, watch this now, what he's saying now is, is that unless you don't esteem yourself, that you become lowly and not worry about status because the greatest in the kingdom of heaven is God. Amen. Amen. If you go to heaven and you have in your mind that I am the greatest, then you esteem yourself above God and that's what happened to Satan. Amen. Mm. That's what happened to Satan. Satan tried to esteem himself above the stars of heaven. I will be like God. I will be like the Most High. And where did that get him? Cast here. John, God is not looking for a rerun of that. God is looking to dwell in the presence of a people that can appreciate him for what they have done. Angels have never felt the joy that our salvation brings. Amen. Amen. And when you recognize the greatness of God, you realize that you ain't really nothing. Yeah. Mm. I ain't really nothing. This ain't about me. This is about what God has done for me in order to bring me here, Freddie. Yes. Yes. So now peep this. Jesus, when those little children 
children are prone to him and the disciples reject him, Jesus says, when you receive one of these little children, it is as if you're accepting me. So at the end of the day, their rejection is not a rejection of the little children, Elvis. It's a, it's a rejection of Christ. Their rejection of the little children, Matthew chapter 18 and verse 5, it says, And whoso shall receive one such little child in my name, receive with me. If they, if, they, if they push away the children, if they attempt to push away the children, they, 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 they are, in a sense, pushing away Christ. Yeah. But thank God that when we forget, because remember, this is just a chapter before, which means that it was a teaching that they received just a few moments ago. Thank God that when we forget the teachings of God, the commandments of God, the testimony of God, that Jesus pardons us from the wrath of God that is supposed to come upon us and continues with business as usual, saving them and saving us. Amen. 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 I want you to realize something. Everything in this chapter, though Jesus is dealing with a different audience, is for his disciples. Who are his disciples? His disciples are students. The Greek word is methotai. His disciples are students. His students are his followers. And if we follow Christ, we got to keep his commandments and we got to ask God to hide the word in our hearts Amen. Yeah. that we may not sin mm -hmm. against him. Yeah. James says that lust brings forth sin. And sin, when it's done, it brings forth death. And at the end of the day, that's what Christ is trying to spare us from. The Bible says that when, if one of us reject one of these children, who is an anti-type of Christ in this context, he says it's better that a millstone be tied around our neck and we be cast into the depth of the sea. You see, the interesting thing is that not only did the Romans crucify people as a, a punishment, they also attempted, they also drowned people as well. So when Jesus says that, he's making reference to that. Now drowning, at the end of the day, is suffocation of the water. But what happens when a millstone is tied around your neck? That means you're sinking to the very bottom and there's no hope for you coming back up. So now imagine what happens when we reject Christ. There is no hope of coming back up. There is no hope of coming back up. But peep this. When God made us, frankly, he breathed into our nostrils what? The breath of life. Yeah. Right? But after we sin, we have life through the blood. Amen. Amen. We are sustained through the blood. It's the blood that covers us. Now pay attention to this. So far, so far, we've discussed that in order to inherit eternal life, the first thing we have to do is deny our physical desires. We have to deny the wants and the demands of our body. Secondly, we have to deny status, societal status, because it prohibits us from acknowledging the greatness of God. These two points are the binding tie that put the interaction between the rich young ruler into proper perspective with Matthew chapter 19, which announces that to inherit eternal life, one must deny self and accept Jesus. Mm -hmm. yeah. The initial question that is postulated by the rich young ruler is primarily concerned with utilizing a method that will cause one to receive eternal life based by works. That is why he approaches Jesus in the manner that he does. He says, good master, what good thing must I do in order that I may receive eternal life? His question is more so about him. Yeah. It's very self-centered self -centered and pharisaical in nature. 
in the sense that it assumes that one can receive salvation by works. This is how this connects to the very first, first, per, first, first portion of the chapter. Do you remember that when the Pharisees came to Jesus, they asked him about an issue of the law. And Jesus says to them, out of the hardness of your heart, you have put away your wives. So the Pharisees believed that they could manipulate the law in order to attain salvation. If one keeps the law, why can't I be saved? But the thing that they didn't understand was the spirit of the law. Because the spirit of the law, within the spirit of the law, is the love for God and the love for humanity. Remember, one asked the question, who is my neighbor? My neighbor is anybody that I can do good unto. Oh. Yeah. Oh, yeah. But Jesus also says to him, if you want to be made perfect, if you want to be made perfect, you see, when Jesus is talking to him, right, he says, he says, if you'll be saved, keep the commandments. He asks him which. He doesn't understand that the law of the law is perfect, converting the soul. He doesn't understand that the, 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 the testimony of God is sure, making wise the simple. He doesn't understand that the commandments of God are pure, enlightening the eyes more so. By them are thy servants kept, and by them is thy great reward. Psalms 19, verse 7 to 11. He wants to know which ones he can keep for his own benefit. Jesus says, if you are to be perfect, that perfection that Jesus is talking about is loving as God loves. Amen. Come on. Amen. Oh, yes. Amen. That's perfect, unadulterated love. But listen to this now. The Apostle Paul, he says that we are saved by grace. It is a gift. Yes. He also says, it is not by works, lest any man should boast. Because if mankind could redeem humanity, the question that we would ask in the kingdom of heaven is, who is the greatest? And it takes the focus off of God. Thank God that you don't have a part to play in my salvation. And thank God I don't have a part to play in your salvation. Because on the surface, we are pretty poor judges. Yeah. Mm. A lot of the times we walk into church and we look for the best singer to be up there, not knowing that the best singer is the one sleeping with the first elder. Mm. A lot of the times we come to church looking for the preacher, but at the end of the day he's sleeping with his secretary. The fact of the matter is, on the surface, we look good and we appear good and we want to, 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 to perform pious works in order to attain, attain entry into the kingdom of God. And God says, no, that's not the way it works. God gave the gift. Christ did the work. Focus on the giver of the gift and then you would understand the sentiment behind it. And at the end of the day, when Jesus calls this young ruler to sell all of his possessions and to follow him, he's not calling him to do anything out of the ordinary. He's calling him to do what he did. What he, what he, what he did. Oh, yes. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. yes, yes. The Bible said, let this mind be in you, which is in Christ Jesus. When, when Paul says that, what he's talking about is being a servant. Oh, yeah. It said that he made himself of no reputation. Though he had the form of God, he took on the form of man. So when he calls this young man to sell all his possessions and to follow him, what he's actually telling him to do, what he's actually challenging him to do, is to come follow him to the cross. This whole thing is not about him not selling his possessions and not following Christ. No, it's about his salvation. It's about our salvation. It is about us being with God forever. And if we don't want to be with God here, how are we going to want to spend time with him up there? It don't make no form of sense. A lot of the time, young people, we ask God to help us on our exams. But we ain't touch the book. <laughs> How we expect to pass. The Bible says, study to show thyself approved. Study to show thyself approved. 
who a workman. There's some work that has to be put in, yes, but there is nothing inherently good in us. Jesus says, listen to what Jesus says about me and you. He says that our hearts are filled with evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witness, blasphemies. Proceed out of the heart of men. Thank God that we don't have a part to play in salvation. That's why Jesus says there's only one good. That is God. And a lot of the time, you read the commentary, when Jesus asks the question, he says, why does that call me good? A lot of people suggest that Jesus is trying to point him to his deity and call him to, cause him to, to call him God, and that's not the case. Jesus is trying to point him to the Father. Because throughout Jesus' entire ministry, it's not even about him. The Bible says he made himself of no reputation. The rich young ruler, his position, his status was wrapped up in his possessions. Who he was was wrapped up in his possession. Jesus said, go and sell all that you have. Because at the end of the day, it held on to his affection. Salvation is not about feelings. It's not about emotion. It's about knowing that inwardly, you're right with God. And when he comes, you're ready to go. Yeah. And when Jesus called him, he wasn't ready to go. And it was better for him. That a millstone was tied around his neck and he was cast into the depth of the sea because at that very moment he rejected Christ. Do you see how everything is connected mm -hmm. in the chapter? Mm -hmm. The essential point, my friends, the essential point is the way to inherit eternal life is to know the only true God. Amen. Amen. And Jesus Christ, whom he sent. Mm -hmm. Every one of us sitting here at this moment have the opportunity to know who God is. You'll leave here. You've heard the word. You might have appreciated said a couple of minutes. But are you going to go back home, take the text that you jotted down, and study them for yourselves? So that when you come back, the following week, you are revived in your spirit. Because at the end of the day, I used to love Jay-Z. And one of Jay-Z's lines in, in the run this town, it says, life starts when the church ends. Mm -hmm. This is a classroom. All of this is theory. When you step outside, Practical application must occur. Because at the end of the day, there are demons outside. Remember, evil can't abide in the presence of God. So when you step outside, there are evil minions waiting to attack you one by one. And you know who he wants? He wants you. He wants you. You know why he wants you? Because there is so much potential energy inside of you that if, he, if you knew for yourself how well, how, how much Jesus can do through you, you turn this world upside down. He's afraid of you. He's afraid of you. Ellen White says that he is afraid of the weakest sinner on his knees. What you gonna do when you leave here? It doesn't matter that you've heard the word, you've rejoiced, and you've said amen. It's what you gonna do with it after. The Bible says when Jesus Tell this young man to told this young man to come and to follow me. He said he left sorrowful. But you don't have to leave here like that today. All you have to do is accept him. The first question that I asked you was, what is the will of God for my life? According to this, according to this chapter. And honestly, the will of God for your life is just to know. Amen. It's just to know. But you can't know if you don't accept the call. What's your name, sweetie? Uh, yes, Maria. Maria. Sorry? Maria. Maria? He's standing at the door of your heart, Maria. And he's not good. He wants entrance. 
I have I have such a dream to be born. Because you all don't understand the risk and the, the danger that you face every day. So great that you might see your nonsense because, because you don't see the potential that you that you have inside of yourself. Inside of each and every one of you young people is power, is youth, is it's its vigor that's waiting to be tapped into. But you just make the wrong choices. And when people are trying to, to steer you in the right direction, I don't want to listen. My girlfriend said to me, her father says, I'm going, I'm coming back from around the block. And y'all are going to it. I've already seen what's happening. And I'm trying to protect you from the dangers that, that lie ahead in this world. That's what Christ came to save us from. That's why he's calling us. That's why he wants us. That's why he wants to bring us to the cross. Amen. There is nothing else. Paul says, I make my boast in the cross. I glory in it. <clears throat> you got to want that thing like you want your necessary food. You ever seen a hungry child in Africa? How his stomach is inside of his ribs? because he hasn't eaten for months. That's how much we got a hunger for the word of God. So that when the call comes, it's easy for us to step out of darkness into his marvelous light. What you gonna do, sweetie? What you gonna do, Frankie? What you gonna do? At the end of the day, the signs are all around us. He's coming soon. Angels cannot tell the joy that our salvation brings. Jesus didn't die for them. He wants you. Because at the end of the day, he wants to do great things with you to proclaim his coming kingdom that he's going to establish here on this earth. You're going to meet a lot of guys in your life. You're going to meet a lot of girls in your life. And at the end of the day, if they can't bring you closer to Christ, they're not worth it. If they cause you to step outside the atmosphere of what is pure, what is true, what is holy, what is full of virtue, leave them alone. Run for your life. Brother, brother Glenn, uh, get Glenn Roy, run like hell. Run for your life. It's not worth it. Save yourself and save that person. Remember I told you Jesus attempted to save four people in a single move. You see, a lot of the times we don't realize when we put people in danger, it demonstrates a hatred for their soul and yours as well. Life has become so self-centered. Men have become lovers of themselves. The, the educational system is about to become so corrupt because they're going to begin to want to bring you children to the courthouse to view gay marriages just because they want to call it an educational experience. And this is what, not, this is what God doesn't deem as right. But you got to be willing to stand or the heavens may fall. Amen. You gotta fight for your life. You gotta ask God to gird you with the helmet of salvation. Put on the breastplate of righteousness. Yes. Charge your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Have the sword and spirit in, uh, in your hand and be ready to fight because we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers in higher places that we cannot contend with. Yes, preach. Yes. Yes. The 
David goes to stand before Goliath. And when he stands before Goliath, he goes in the name of the Lord. That is the only reason why he wins the fight. It's not about a stone and it's not about a sling. At the end of the day, those are instruments that God will use. The same way that he wants to use you as an instrument when he calls you so that you can do great things in his name. Moses' rod that turned into a staff is nothing but a stick. But at the end of the day, when the power of God and the name of God was attached to it, that's where the power came from. And one can only love God as he's obedient. But at the end of the day, the enemy wants you to sink beneath the depth of the water with the millstone tied around your neck. Mm -hmm. It's not about you. It's about following Christ. And all you got to do at this point, if you want it, is just stand. I'll come to you because that's the way that Christ works. He comes to us. Adam and Eve fled. They weren't afraid of God. Remember, God told them if they ate the fruit, they would die. So when God came and he spoke to them, why do you think they spoke back? They weren't afraid of God. They were afraid of death. But the Christian has the hope, Brother Glenn, that when they die, if they die in Christ, they will resurrect when he comes. And the dead in Christ shall rise first. And those that remain will be caught up in the air to meet him. Mm -hmm. Me and you, we're going to see our fathers when we get there. Mm -hmm. We're going to see people that we've lost on this earth when we get there. We might even see some enemies, but that's why we got to love each other the way that God loves. Because at the end of the day, the person that you're sitting next to that you don't like is the same person that you should expect to see when you get there. Mm -hmm. This thing is about heaven. And heaven is just a place, so this thing is about God. God is just trying to defend his name. At the end of the day, the enemy has been trying from the beginning of time to make God to be a liar. But what does he say? Thy word is truth. Sanctify them by thy truth. And God just wants to sanctify you. He wants to put you through this process to, to bring you into the creature that he wants you to become. Day by day, one step at a time. And if that's what you want to do, I just, I just want you to stand. Even before you stand, I want you to think. Because there's a people who don't know how to think. Because we allow everything else to do the thinking for us. We go on Facebook, and at the end of the day, we have someone send us a message, and we'll quote that message like if it's the gospel. <laughs> that thought was very profound. A lot of evil people that, that, that said profound things too. And at the end of the day, there's a lot of good people that said profound things too. But there's going to be a lot of them in hell. That ain't going to be a lonely place. But you see, the thing is, misery loves company. So that's why the enemy comes to attack us. Because he don't want to die alone. He's afraid of it. Fear is the absence of understanding what is to come in the future. Fear is the absence of faith. And when you rely on God, that, 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 that everlasting arm, and, and, and you know that your life is in his hands, you'll get down on your knees to pray. And you begin to try to confess sins, and you see that there is nothing that the enemy can bring against you. Jesus says he takes everything that we have ever done when we confess his name, and he casts it into the depths of the sea. And he puts a sign there that says no fishing. It can't be recalled. So if God forgets it, who can remember it? Because he says, I am the same from everlasting to everlasting. And if he forgives you, then that means that the event never happened. All you got to do is accept it. All you got to do is raise your hand. All you got to do is stand to your feet. Will you at this time? Now realize this, you've stood, you've taken action. Now at the end of the day, what are we going to do next? See, that's what matters the most. What are, what's the next move? We have to be very strategic as we fight in this great controversy. 
Because at the end of the day, if we attempt to fight in our strength, if we believe that we can attain this salvation by works, we have a, it's a, it's a, it's a horse of a different color. It's another thing coming to us. We will fail in our own strength. Do you remember when Abraham attempted to have the child, he, he attempted to fulfill God's promise? It brought strife. It brought contention. And at the end of the day, if we try to fight in this great controversy by ourselves, it will bring strife. It will bring contention. Young people, we will not learn who we are, and we will be going through identity crisis for the rest of our lives. All Christ wants to do is to tell you who you are in Him. Revelation 4 verse 11 tells us that we were made for His pleasure. And when Jesus came out of the water, what did He say? This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. So if we're made for His pleasure, and Jesus pleased God by being baptized, what pleases God in our lives is us doing the will of God. And the will of God at this time is that you just accept Him. And realize that you can't do anything without the power of Christ in you. It's the spirit that works in you to will and to work. If you don't have a church home, and you're interested in becoming a member of this church, I just ask you to see Brother Andy at the end of the service. Just bow heads. Father, they are young people. They are more experienced people. And there is a division amongst us because we are not caught up in you. Father in heaven, you gave me this word. We've wrestled with one another. And now there are many people wrestling with your spirit because of the great truths that are contained therein. We are people that realize that need, that, that need you. Because at the end of the day, this thing is not about us. It's about you and following you to the cross and taking off our status and realizing just like you that took off reputa your reputation. So become one of us and to be numbered amongst us and to die for us. We need you. Help us, oh God. Bless all the people in here. Fill them with your Holy Spirit. Help them not to leave here just with a good word in their ear or a word that they believe is mediocre, but help them to take God's word to go home by their bedside and just study what you have said. They have stood for you. Now, Lord, mobilize their legs that they may walk in the way of our Father. The word says that you are the way, the truth, and the life, and there is no way unto God. This is about us abiding in your presence forever. So at this time, we pray that you seal us with your Holy Spirit so that when you come, we may be caught up to meet you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.
and Jesus Christ, who thou hast sent. Bless every person in your name, Father. And as they lead, may they not forget what has occurred here in this place. May they seek a, seek a deeper hope of thee. May they crave your spirit. Be with each parent. Give them the patience. Give them the know-how and the instructions. Educate their children in the way that they should go. Thank you for hearing and thank you for answering. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <laughs> Amen. We welcome all of you to the lunch that is there uh, in the next building. Come socialize with us, get to know each other. And a happy Sabbath and see you all again next week or whenever you may be able to come. Thank you.